Content warning, this episode contains discussion of mental health issues, violence, and murder. The Richard Allen case has quite a few of us thinking about how a defendant's mental health can affect his ultimate fate in the justice system. What does it take, for instance, for a defendant to successfully plead not guilty by reason of insanity or NGRI? What tests or evaluations are performed to ensure that the defendant is truly mentally ill and not just faking it in hopes of avoiding consequences for his crime? And beyond NGRI, how do courts determine if someone is even mentally competent to stand trial at all? We were lucky enough to find an expert in the field who was willing to talk us through all the issues. We'll refer to her as Margaret, although that's not her real name. Because she's still professionally active in this area, she asked us not to use her name, but we did verify her work credentials. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is Mental Health in the Criminal Justice System. What's the difference between not guilty by reason of insanity and incompetent to stand trial? To start off with, can you just tell us a bit about your background in the mental health space? So, let's see. I've been working in mental health, um, you know, probably since at least 2007. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in psychology, and then I went and got my master's and PhD in clinical psychology. And that was in 2015, and I've been working in mental health since. And and can you talk a bit about your work potentially being as vague as you want to be with people who are declared not guilty by reason of insanity? Yeah, so when I was in graduate school, um, I was able to do, I guess, somewhat of like a specialty um, emphasis in forensic psychology. And so I did coursework with a faculty member who did a lot of forensic work, but I also worked at a state hospital and this was in Virginia specifically. So a lot of what I know is relevant to how Virginia handles things. Um, But I was able to work with people that were adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity, as well as people who were found incompetent to stand trial. And some of that work was preparing really lengthy reports. Some of it was therapy oriented and some of it was more assessment. Um, I guess, you know, what in a nutshell can you tell us about sort of the concept of not guilty by reason of insanity? So whenever I talk about not guilty by reason of insanity or NGRI, there's a couple things that I kind of like to highlight up front. You know, one is 
I think, you know, the most people have a pretty big misconception about it, which I think is like kind of fueled by media, different things. But the first thing is, is that it's very, very rarely used. Um, I want to say the numbers are like 1% of cases. I mean, it's just, it's not used that often because it's usually, you know, jur- juries don't really want to hear it. Um, and then even in the cases that it's used, it's successful like 25% of the time. So it's, it's not a very common defense. Um, and even when it is used, it's not, you know, often successful. So that's the first thing. The other misconception is that like just because somebody has some kind of mental health diagnosis does not mean that they would be found in, insane at the time of the offense. Um, you know, somebody could have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and be saving when they commit a crime. And so that's one thing I've heard a lot when listening to true crime is people will often, you know, almost confuse the two. Like, well, that person, you know, clearly has mental health diagnoses. I don't know why they weren't found insane. And it's, it's just not the same thing. Um, kind of in a nutshell, when you're talking about not guilty by reason of insanity, you really are looking at the defendant's state of mind at the time of the offense. So there's an assessment that um, forensic psychiatrists or psychologists do called an MSO or mental status at time of the offense. And in that assessment, you're really reviewing everything around the crime. So kind of pre-offense behavior, post-offense behavior, and then during the offense. Um, and that's what you're looking at to try to determine the state of mind somebody was in when they committed the crime. Now, there's three prongs to this that you look for. Two of the prongs are pretty consistent across all the states that have NDRI as a defense. And then one of them, um, only some states have it and some states don't. So I can get into those three things if you want. That would be amazing. Okay. Okay. So the two that all states have, one is that the person did not know what they were doing was morally wrong um, when they committed the crime. So for example, if you had somebody who thought that they were killing a demon, um, then they're not going to think what they're doing is morally wrong. The other one is they don't understand the consequences of their action. And we call this one the squeezing a lemon test, which is that if you're strangling somebody, but you think that you're squeezing a lemon, you don't understand the consequences of your action. And so those are the two prongs that are pretty well established. Um, across the United States and the states that do have NGRI. The third one that is, you know, not all states have it, is this one called an irresistible impulse, which is that, like, basically the person's unable to stop themselves from committing the crime. And um, they kind of call this, like, a police at arm's length test, meaning that if you had a police officer, you know, at arm's length, would you still have done this crime? That's the irresistible impulse part. That makes a lot of sense. So those are sort of the building blocks of what you're looking for when you're trying to determine that. Exactly. And so, you know, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of people who get found um, or acquitted in VRI, they'll have a history of mental illness, but not always. I mean, you could have somebody that, has never had any kind of treatment, no diagnoses, and it could be like their first psychotic break. And that's kind of why this the MSO um, assessment I was talking about, or the MSO evaluation, you're really looking at the behavior of the person around the crime. Because if they don't know what they did was morally wrong, there's going to be different behaviors than if they know what they did is morally wrong and they're trying to cover it up. 
And that's where you get into sort of the malingering side of things, potentially somebody, you know, maybe trying to emphasize symptoms in order to possibly look insane. Yeah, you can definitely. I mean, you know, I think everyone's kind of worst fear around the NVRI defense is people malingering, right? People saying they were insane and they weren't. Um, the, I think the, the good news there is one, you know, things like, I mean, if you try to hide, you know, say that somebody has stabbed somebody and then they've cleaned the knife and hid in the knife. That tells you that they're trying to cover up the crime. Therefore, they're, they knew that they would get in trouble. So that kind of speaks against, you know, the insanity um, defense. Now, once somebody, like say if, you know, somebody's already um, detained, there's a lot of assessments out there that we can use for malingering. And some of them are really, they're really split. It's not like these, I don't know, kind of outrageous things. It's, it's usually part of other assessments. You're able to see if somebody's exaggerating their symptoms or anything like that. And, you know, in, in terms of, I'm just curious with the process and the procedure, you've talked a bit about, you know, what's looked for and sort of how this mm-hmm. works. Um, but, you know, as far as like, how are people, I, I imagine it may av- av- differentiate between state and in different jurisdictions, essentially. But um, Mm -hmm. in your experience, like, how are people exactly looked at and sort of evaluated in order to kind of come to some of these conclusions about whether they're sane or not sane? That's a great question. So I never personally did um, an MSO evaluation, but as part of my, like, the course that I did, we had to review, we kind of had to do, like, a mock MSO evaluation, basically. And a lot of what you're looking at, you're going to, you know, meet with the defendant, you would evaluate them, you know, you would assess what they're saying to you, what they're saying happened, symptoms they're reporting, all of that. But you're also going to spend a lot of time assessing um, police reports and like crime scene information. Like you're really looking at the whole picture you know, trying to get an idea really based on, because, you know, we know that, and and I mean, when you assess them, you might be doing some amount of assessment for malingering, but also we know that like, you can't always take what people tell you at face value. And so you also want to go back and look at their behaviors around the crime. You know, I guess some of the examples that pop into my head would be like, you know, there's been cases where people have called the cops on themselves and called the cops You know, I did this, I did that. That's going to look more like maybe the person didn't know what they were doing wrong than if somebody tries to hide from the cop or tries to hide their involvement, you know, things like that. So, you know, as much as like you still do want to meet with the defendant and evaluate them, but you really are doing almost more of like a historical evaluation. Uh, One question we get a lot is people... Uh, have questions about the difference between, say, a not guilty by reason of insanity and the finding that someone may or may not be competent to stand trial. Can you discuss what goes into the decision as to whether or not someone is competent to stand trial? Yes. So they're completely different things. Somebody could be incompetent to stand trial, but you know, not do any kind of plea of NGRI and vice versa. Somebody could have been completely, you know, quote, insane the time of the offense, but be competent to stand trial. So competency to stand trial, you're really looking at the defendant in the here and now. Whereas the NGRI, you're looking at the defendant at the time of the offense. So with competency to stand trial, you're really assessing, does the person have the ability and the capacity to understand what's going on in the courtroom, meaning like, do they understand the charges against them? Do they understand that they're in a courtroom? Do they understand that their lawyer is there to help them? Um, That's one prong. The other one is, are they able to assist in their defense? So, you know, I worked with some people that were found incompetent to stand trial and they were at the state hospital. And really, the treatment at that point is getting them on medication, 
Um, usually they're psychotic, so they need some kind of medication to help with that. And then the therapy is usually more like educational groups on a courtroom. You know, I remember one of the groups that I did, we literally kind of had a diagram of the courtroom and would go through, you know, who sits here and who sits there. And then what are the different plea options that you have? So it's much more like, what is this person's mental state right now? That's competency. And then not guilty by reason of insanity is what was the person's mental state around the offense? Uh, some people oft also have the misconception that if a defendant acts like a while during the trial, that is somehow indicative of their mental status at the time of his offense. Can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, I mean, again, that might speak to their competency to stand trial, but it doesn't mean anything really about their mental state at time of the offense. Sure, like it could relate, but it also could not just as easily. You know, if somebody's in a courtroom, I don't know, acting as though they're hallucinating or, you know, delusional, maybe they're in the courtroom and they think that, you know, um, they're in outer space or something like that. My first thought would be competency to stand trial, um, because obviously that person might not um, be in the same reality that we're in, right? They might be, um, you know, in need of medication, really. But that doesn't mean that that was their mental state when they committed the crime. And that's part of what you're evaluating by looking at their behavior around the crime. And, you know, for the most part, it's my experience, you know, I have some friends that are lawyers and things like that. It's my, you know, experience that for the most part, when somebody is incompetent to stand trial, their lawyers usually text that, before they're in the courtroom um, and the lawyers are trying to get a competency evaluation long before the person's in the courtroom. And so it, it'd be pretty surprising to have somebody, you know, kind of in court and that hasn't been caught already. This sort of ties back to something that we previously spoke about with not guilty by reason of insanity, um, but also competency to stand trial. And it's, it's just this idea that, you know, Somebody could have a you know a, a something that prompts them to have delusions or psychosis or whatnot, and that doesn't mean that they were necessarily insane at the time of the crime or incompetent to stand trial. Um, and that's something yeah. we kind of have discussed here. But just to kind of really put a fine point on that, you know, I think a lot of people might be like, "Wait, really? Like, you know, I would think that if you were having psychosis in general, that would almost put you into one category or the other." But I'm wondering, can you talk through like why those things are not necessarily the same thing as being incompetent to stand trial or insane? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I had a really good example. And if I think of one, I'll run through it. But, it, but what pops in my head is that you could be hallucinating, hearing voices telling you, you know, whatever the voices are telling you, let's say, I don't know, the voices are telling you that you're no good, that, um, you know, you don't deserve to be alive, things like that. And then you go out and you murder somebody. That does not mean that you did not know that you were murdering somebody and that that was morally wrong and that that was illegal. So that's, that's sort of the difference um, is that, I mean, those are really, it's really specific what you're looking for is that the person did not know what they were doing was morally wrong um, or that they did not understand that by doing whatever they were doing, they were harming or going to kill a person. Um, those are kinds of the things that you're looking for. So, you know, um, some of the things you know, without getting too specific, some of the things that I had seen really involved, you know, somebody thinking somebody else was a demon or that if they did not kill them, they would not get into heaven. And in those cases, they did not think what they were doing was morally wrong. They thought that they were saving the person. So, you know, and that person might have not necessarily been hearing voices or acting crazy. You know, that might have been all internal. So, you know, 
yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think about how better to define that. But yeah, just because somebody is hearing voices or believing things that aren't there, that does not mean that those are the reasons that they committed the crime. I think you did a splendid job of sort of defining it and and characterizing it. Can I give a really stupid example that popped into my head? Um, And and please shoot it down if it's wrong (laughs) or inappropriate, because I will cut it out. But um, it almost strikes me as like if you say, if you're trying to make an excuse to your spouse about why you cheated... And Mm -hmm. you're like, you basically say, I have a drinking problem, so that's why I cheated. And your spouse is more of looking at, well, were you drunk at the time that the act of adultery was committed versus, you know, do you have a drinking problem? And that just kind of doesn't really factor into it. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting example. Um, (laughs) That's one way of putting it. I like it. I like it. Well, (laughs) You know, my first reaction was like, oh, well, you know, substance abuse doesn't count for this NGRI thing. But, I mean, that's kind of it, right? Let's say let's say your spouse cheats on you uh, because they're drunk. <laughs> do, in their drunken stupor, do they know that that person is not you, mm-hmm. right? Or do they think that that was you the whole time? Right. That's kind of the difference, you know? Exactly. And that's what – I'm not trying to compare – substance abuse to (laughs) to psychosis i myself am a recovering alcoholic so i i know they're so different i'm just more thinking about it from a kind of thought exercise of if we're equating the drunkenness to the insanity then just because you have a drinking problem doesn't mean you're always drunk necessarily right and it doesn't mean that you can like excuse everything because of that you know and i mean it's it really you know my experience working in mental health it's really kind of the same like People can have mental health diagnoses, but that's not the totality of them, right? Like it might explain some of their behaviors, but not all of their behaviors. It might explain some of their feelings and thoughts, but not all of them. Right. And and to kind of say, well, they committed this heinous crime because of their mental health issues almost feels like it would be a denigration to others with mental health issues or those same struggles or diagnoses who were not being violent. Yep. That's yeah. Very well said. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is, I mean, this is such a fascinating conversation and I just, um, you know, I, I'm curious just in your, in your experience, you know, you talked a bit in your email about this, but what does life after a NGRI verdict look like? Cause it sounds like it may not be what people expect. Yeah, you know, I so this was like the part that I was um, the biggest part of um, in my experience working at uh, you know a state hospital. So, it, you know, and this and this could vary state to state. Um, at least a couple of the states I lived in, this was the same kind of process. But basically, if somebody is found not guilty by reason of insanity, they're sent to a state hospital, and it's a forensic hospital. So. They're sent there with other people that are found not guilty by reason of insanity. And, you know, at least at first, they're kind of really essentially on lockdown. They really can't leave the unit. Um, they really can't go outside, right? They'll, they can go with everyone else, all the other patients, groups and things like that. They can meet with their counselor, with their doctor. But they're not, you know, going to be able to go even outside. And then gradually over time, you know, as the person um, is compliant with their treatment, meaning, you know, they'll have a treatment team that's making these recommendations, you know, take this medication, you know, do this therapy. As they're compliant with treatment, they might be um, kind of put up for increased privileges. And when I'm saying put up, I mean the psychologist um, or a member of their treatment team would write a very giant report that goes to two boards, usually depending on the level of um, privilege they're trying to get, it might go to one or two boards. But essentially, let's say somebody's brand new 
then, you know, they're complying with their treatment, they're stabilizing, a report's written that's going to go to an internal board that says, hey, you know, we want this this person to be able to go outside, but escorted. So we're applying for escorted ground privileges. And then the board discusses it. So first it's discussed by the treatment team, the psychologist or whomever, usually the psychologist or mental health counselor is going to write the report. Then that goes up to the board for approval or not. Then let's say somebody gets approved for that. They have to kind of demonstrate that they're able to manage that level of privilege and remain compliant and all of that. And then they can kind of increase um that level of privilege or level of freedom over time. So it's like escorted ground and then unescorted ground. And then the next one would be almost like a day pass, but an escorted community kind of day pass where they're with a staff member from the hospital and maybe they're going with some other patients that have the same privilege level and they're going to go to Walmart, right? And then they'll come back. So you kind of work your way up through these levels and really, I guess, kind of the, the one, you know, everyone wants is this um, conditional release, which conditional release is that, you know, you've been able, by that point, you've had passes out into the community escorted. You've had passes out into the community where you are in the custody of a family member or some other trusted person. And you've demonstrated that, you know, you can do those things and be compliant and, you know, basically not raise any red flags. Then the conditional release would be being kind of sent out into the community. It's all super planned, you know, where the person's going to be staying, where they're going to be going for treatment, all of those things. And it's conditional release because, they have to report back. They have to attend treatment. They have to, you know, go to their psychiatrist, go to their therapist. And if anything is messed up, then that's revoked. And so that goes to at least two boards where you're, the internal board is looking at it. And then there's an external board as well. And so there's a lot of eyes on that. Um, after somebody's been out on conditional release for a while, if they're demonstrating that they can maintain that, then at a certain point they might be put up for unconditional release, which means they, they no longer are monitored in those same ways. I'm I'm curious, you know, I, I know you don't necessarily have the, the, the prison side of that experience, but just, you know, having worked in that space at all, do you have a sense of whether it's better or easier than prison? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I don't have a direct correlate to like compare it to, but I will say, you know, I can think of at least a couple people that I worked with that spent more time in the forensic psychiatric facility than they would have spent in prison for a crime. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't a, I mean, it was still a crime, but maybe it wasn't as major of a crime. And if they had just gone the guilty route, they, you know, would have maybe been out in a year or two. And instead, it's like a five-year process, six-year process for them to get out on unconditional release from the forensic psych hospital. Absolutely. So, yeah, it sounds like there might be some definite drawbacks in, in those instances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and... You know, with with NGRI, I guess, is there anything else about um, life after that that might surprise people who've never been through the system and are not familiar with anyone who has? Um, you know, I guess one of the things is that, you know, there are some people, one, um, who they'll probably never be approved for, you know, the conditional release because of the nature of their crime. So really, no matter how stable they get in a psychiatric facility, they will likely never get out because, you know, their crime was that horrendous and the public outcry would, you know, be too much. Um, The politics wouldn't look good, basically. You know, I think about about like John Hinsley, 
So that's one thing that, you know, there are some people that, you know, that that's their life now, you know, they're not going to get out necessarily. As far as, you know, uh, if somebody were to go through the whole process and then finally get, you know, unconditionally released, you know, I don't necessarily think that their life after that would be any different than really any other person, um, apart from that they just spent a very long time going through that process. And and then just as um, a mental health professional who has, you know, worked in that space, but also who listens to some true crime programs, <laughs> I, I imagine that could be a frustrating experience sometimes. Um, but are there any other widespread mis misconceptions or perceptions that you've noticed that, um, you know, are maybe not completely true to life or maybe kind of getting people to think the wrong way about these things? That's a great question. I, I feel like I, I have a million thoughts and I'm trying to pick which one to go with. Um, you know, I, I guess some of the things I see are, you know, I think I think we can be really quick, one, to diagnose people um, or want to di diagnose people. And, you know, it's a very specific process. There's a book that we use for that. Um, you know, but by the same token, there's a lot of kind of armchair diagnosing like, oh, yeah, this person's, you know, narcissistic, kind of these pop psychology terms. And, um, you know, we, we really don't know that without evaluating a person and having a qualified professional evaluate that person. I mean, that's one thing that I definitely see thrown around a lot. Um, you know, I do see um, as well, you know, maybe some confusion or mistakes around diagnoses at times. Um you know, like I said, maybe things just being thrown out there. Um, a lot of what we've talked about with an insanity plea, um, absolutely that. And then, you know, um, just also the difference. So, like, for one thing, you know, the whole label of even insane, that's not a clinical term, right? There's no diagnosis of insanity. That's a legal term. And I know that can be confusing to people. I'm trying to think what, what, what other aspects. I mean, I, I guess, you know, working in the mental health field, a couple things that I really see is like, it's no surprise to anybody, but, you know, it's just mental illness is very hard to treat, especially when it's severe mental illness and there's not enough providers. Um, you know, so there's a ton of barriers. And some of what I saw personally when I was working in forensic psychology was, you know, sometimes people being let down by the mental health system. So, you know, somebody running out of medications and not being able to get in with their doctor and then having a psychotic episode and committing a crime. And it's a really sad, you know, uh, I guess, event or instance because, you know, this person, if they were kept on medications, that might have never happened. And instead... So many lives are changed. And then by the same token, you know, mental health providers are people. So, I mean, you know, I see it on all fronts, but I, I do just know there's always this push about we need more mental health, we need more mental health. But I don't really think that it's like kind of addressing a lot of the core issues. And then I guess the other thing I would say is I hear, you know, psychopath and sociopath thrown around all the time. And like neither of those are diagnoses either. So that's a side though. But yeah. Yes, not a real thing. So and we shouldn't be uh, listening to people on TikTok talking about them because they probably don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Or diagnosing people, at least if they're just talking generalities, then that's probably fine. Um you know, in, in terms of um, one thing I wanted to ask that's a little bit specific to a case that we covered, Delphi, um, and, and not certainly not going to ask you to diagnose anybody or anything like that, just more of like, you know, I guess like the idea of if a person were to commit a really horrific crime and then like, you know, like try to make an insanity plea on that years later, you know, even though like they didn't confess to anyone in that time or whatever, would that go against an insanity defense or would, you know, like kind of the act of hiding it for all that time or would that not yeah, really I, go into play? 
Yeah, you know, look, I mean, I, I would think so. And I've thought this about Delphi. I've thought this about, um, you know, the Idaho murders and what is it, Brian Kohlberg. Like, Heidi, you know, usually when somebody, you know, commits a murder and they're insane, like, they're caught really quickly because they're not trying to hide anything. So they're not going to change their clothes. They're not going to hide the murder weapon. You know, I mean, numerous things. Like, there's usually not a lot of planning that's going into it, things like that. So they typically are caught pretty quick. I mean, you know, sometimes they don't even, they don't run. They don't hide at all. Um, So when you see these crimes like these where, you know, the person has to be kind of found, really, that goes against the person, you know, the person was, they're trying to cover their tracks, which means, you know, that they understood what they did, they were going to get in trouble for, and they knew the consequences of it. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And, and then my follow up on the Delphi side of things is just, you know, I'm not sure if this ever like overlapped with your experience in, in the space of, you know, working with people with, you know, who'd gone through NGRI or anything. But I I guess, you know, the idea that somebody can essentially develop psychosis after a few months of essentially solitary confinement, does that track Mm -hmm. with any of your experiences? You know, I have never seen that um, professionally, but it makes like theoretical and clinical sense that that could happen. Um, you know, it's, I guess as human beings, whenever we're put in a situation that overwhelms our ability to cope, that's a crisis. And being put in some sort of solitary confinement, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think somebody could develop some kind of psychosis from that time. Again, I've never seen that clinically. But, you know, theoretically speaking, yeah, it makes sense. Um, and again, that would probably speak to competency to stand trial. If it's a case of possible malingering, then that could probably be rooted out pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. There's, you know, there's some pretty quick assessments that can be done for that. And like, you know, you mix those in with other things. You don't just do those on their own and they're, they're not obvious. So, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, listen, this has been terrific. Is there anything we didn't ask you about that you wanted to mention? No, I really, I genuinely appreciate this. And uh, thank you guys so much for your time. We would like to thank Margaret for taking the time to speak with us. We very much appreciate her time and insight. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.